Hi, Vinka. How are you? Good. Good morning. Good morning. We, we spent a fantastic night in Philadelphia. Yeah. And before we, we joined your uh, European midterm critics, it was very enjoyable and good people. Thank you. You, you organized the many role of them and then uh, fantastic students. What happened in uh, in last decade in the UK? <laughs> in the last nine years. Um, yeah, so nine years ago I started, well, I was 10 years, I was the director of the second master's, which is a postgraduate program that Ali now runs. Ali Rahim now Ali runs. Rahim? Yeah, so for 10 years I ran, I actually founded, started, and ran the, the postgraduate. We didn't have a postgraduate before. So it was 2003. And then in 2013, they asked me to apply to be the chair. And having been at Penn, I realized it was actually an interesting challenge. And it was also for me maybe a little easier because I knew the people, I respected my colleagues. I thought I had amazing colleagues. But I also realized that Penn was not very well known in the world which was strange because we were one of the better schools, I thought. Um, so the first thing I did is I, when I started as chair, I said to my faculty, we're like an oyster. Um, we're like really rough and closed on the outside, but we have a pearl inside. And it's time we show the people in the world what we do. We should share our knowledge more. We should be much more open. We should be better hosts. We should receive more guests. And we should become people that are like super easy to access. So the first thing I did was start this little monster that we now bring out every year. Um, this is number nine in my year nine. And uh, the, the few rules for this book was um, I wanted to be an actual book book, so it's bound, hand bound, um, which means you can open the pages perfectly flat. So you can make um, images that go through. You can leave it open on your desk as a reference. And it's um, recycled ink. It's a recycled paper and non-toxic ink. I find that really important. We don't print many. We, we keep it very selective uh, because we, ha we have them online free as an ebook. So anyone can read this. You don't have to get this. After three years of publishing this book, I realized when I was giving lectures through the US, that people were using it as teaching material and that um, maybe it's possible to find a publisher. So that meant we spend a lot of less money, we even share it more, and you know the distribution is not done. We didn't distribute it before, we just gave it to our guests, we send it to people we like, we send it to other schools. Um, but it wasn't worldwide, and now it's published by Oro here. Yeah, from uh, California, San yeah. Francisco, right? Yeah, Gordon, and uh, Gordon publishes this and basically distributes it. What is really fun is that we have an, a, a conference. We also, so that was the one thing was the book. The other thing was every year I started doing a big conference. Not a small local conference, but a big conference where we invited people from all over the US, often international. Uh, and just made it a rule that every year we had one. I started the first one, uh, which we called the new normal, and the, the stance was, as we all know from the 90s, the, in uh, New York City, we were already digital then. Um, so I basically stated as the new normal, after 20 years of digital design, we reached the platform from, when, from where we have to start innovating again. Because too many people kept, kept saying, oh, digital is new. How long can you say it's new? I was like 20 years old. So I said, we do a conference on what is after the 20 years, which was a really fun conference. It talked about robotics. It talked about new materialities. It talked about other roles the architect had. We found that uh, we did a panel on hybrid architects not hybrid architectures, but architects, you know, like people who were in robotics and architecture, people who were in fashion and architecture, people who were in product development in architecture. So very interesting kind of hybrid status because we realized the way we work now, 3D in the digital environment, 
we are much more than just architects. We are also product developers. We make new products for architecture. We rethink architecture in components rather than slabs and columns. So one big thing was open the school up, distribute knowledge, and in the same time, of course, you're distributing it to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. we, we completely changed communication around. So that was the, that was the very first thing I did. And then after post-pandemic time, then the education system, and how did it affect that? And uh, did, did, yeah. did, you, did, you, did you start again with the conference and lectures? Oh yeah, we have a huge conference this fall, mm -hmm. Acadia. It's, a, a, it's actually a, a global conference um, that people host. So we won the bid to because host. We, we missed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Because we did it with almost two years, more than two years. Ago. Although all our lectures were live streamed, and yeah. I think we had more viewers than we ever had visitors. We had thousands of viewers for our lectures, which is like really phenomenal. Um, I don't, you know, what was interesting? We were on spring break in March 2020 when I got a call from my boss here, the dean, and he said, you get one week to put the whole place online. Now, this place, my department was around 270 people, uh, students. When I started, we have close to 400 now. So actually more than 400 now, because we, I started three MSD programs. We have the MARC, we have undergrad, and we have PhD. So the department is huge. It's more than half of the school of design. So basically that putting it online was like an interesting task. But then you also realize architects, we are digital, we are already so used to um, communicating online, talking online, everything we do we design in the computer. So although it seemed impossible, funny enough, after that week we were online and doing fine. We had meetings with the faculty two, three times a month, in the beginning a lot more. Uh, we met our students, normal class time. The one thing, funny enough, I had to tell the faculty is not to give them longer. Because mm. how easy is it? You're sitting in your living room, you're talking to your students, it's really great. But what everyone forgot is they have to do homework, they have other classes, you can't keep them hours, you know, in studio, after studio time. So that was actually, that was the only thing that at some point I have to rail in and say, guys, you know, I know you, you are super excited and that you just want to really help, but you have to keep it to the time. The other thing I did is I had a call in uh, hour, lunchtime, every Tuesday for anyone who wanted to talk. So I just would open my Zoom together with my um, staff member who dealt with students, and we would chat ourselves. And then students would come in. Sometimes they would be making oatmeal with us. Sometimes they'd be like talking about their project. Sometimes they ask advice on, should I do this course or that course? Sometimes they just wanted to chat. Sometimes they had sad news. Sometimes it was really hard. We had someone who was really upset and sad and lonely. So I had to kind of say, like, you stay on, you know, after the meeting, I, co I talk to you alone. Um, so, but that was really good, I think, because they felt I was there for them always. You know, they could always talk to us. So that was, the personal thing was really important. What we realized after is that education went fine um, but what they missed was learning from each other, right? So the fact that here in the U.S. they have studio, they can stay all day in studio, they talk to each other, they learn from each other, they see uh, what they do, they help each other, that was gone. So we realized that's... the physical a, modeling or understanding to some 
Yeah, it's not so much physical modeling, it's just really talking to each other. You know, like they learn a lot from each other. Because, you know, in a studio you have good, middle, and not so good students, but by the end of the studio, we try and have everyone on the same level. And that helps, and that happens because they help each other also. So they learn from each other. They pull each other up. There is a re few really good ones that pull all the ones, other ones up. They inspire each other. It didn't happen so much online. Although we were all online and they saw each other's work, that was the only thing I think that that was really sad for them. The whole social aspect, but also the learning aspect that they learned from each other. But for us, I think it went fine. We had no major crashes. And people, last year we were hybrid. My faculty was phenomenal. You know, they all were teaching in person, but if anyone had to stay in quarantine or had a problem, they would just teach hybrid. You know, so we had several students on the screen and several students in class, and we did everything in one thing. So you have people here sitting on a laptop, the rest sits in front of you. We were all sitting in glass boxes. They made every desk into a little glass aquarium. Box. Yeah. Plexiglass boxes and um, masks, plexiglass boxes. And we taught like that for two years. This is very funny. So we were one of the first to come back in class mm. and really teach them because we realized they really missed that aspect. Of course. And plus then, you know, they didn't have, as you said, access to the fabrication lab. They didn't have access to the robotics lab. So actually the robotics people were in class. Mm. We kept them in the school. Mm. Because we have a MSD in robotics and autonomous systems, uh, they need robots. So we let them in the school, the whole little MSD program. And then you, you established uh, the robotics system laboratory. Yeah, yeah. basically I started that when? three, four years ago. A couple of years ago. Yeah, the first summer with Andrew Saunders together, we interviewed all the robotics companies. Mm. KUKA, Staubli, and ABB. And we chose ABB because ABB has a huge innovation research lab here in Pennsylvania. And they seem to be the most willing to collaborate with us. Mm -hmm. and, and as we, we have this thing of sharing, we really wanted to share and collaborate with someone, not so much just have a robot. Mm -hmm. No, we wanted to have that knowledge. We wanted to have them as experts. So that's been really good. Did you start the um, three? How can I call that the building three D three D printing building? There is no the the word actually that. Yeah, that I mean, I, it's, the it's printing is not the same. I think the building. How yeah, can we, it's a weird right now. Yeah, it's also we need I a think new you word, know like oh, a Google or something. Yeah. I think Obama started this thing, like, you know, where he was, oh my God, we can 3D, 3D print buildings. 3D printing buildings is possible, but it's not very elegant, right? Because you yeah. pour concrete in these slurvy round things, and what you're making is some sort of adobe house, which is not really advanced architecture. So I'm personally more interested in um, creating and manufacturing prefabricated components in a factory that are like designed much more like a large furniture, have amazing detailing. That way you have lot less waste, it's environmentally much better, you can make them much better insulated, but also you make another architecture, you can make a component architecture, and I'm really interested in that rather than, you know, little pieces of brick from God knows Roman times that we're stacking on top of each other. Um, I'm much more interested in really innovating architecture like we make cars or like we make planes, you know. Yeah, maybe we can find a way with the, with the hybrid system. Yeah. Because there are many, many surfaces and then elements that, uh, today that after creating, especially the build, building something, there are yeah. many, many pieces, 300, something like that. There are different places for floor, walls, and uh, mm -hmm. envelope on top of skin and roof. 
Maybe yeah. they they give uh, the robotic system. They give us the two things first: uh, uh, safe safety about uh, because there are yeah. many, many uh, accidents for to build it up a building. Mm -hmm. Work, workers. Especially. Yeah, you're thinking robotic installation on site, but we do a lot here to kind of see how you can change design also with making, yeah. you know, using robots to make elements. Um, we do, we work with robots and, um, well, one thing I've done also for Penn, I feel, you know, having, I worked a lot with the MIT Media Lab in my office yeah. for installations, for interactive environments, and I felt that what I learned from the MIT Media Lab is that you can work with experts in the field, like we work with you. Right, with GAD. So we like having our experts that come and talk to our students. We also have sponsors that sponsor materials. We work with Le Monde, uh, the formal bicycle uh, to the France uh, champion, uh, that gives us uh, carbon fiber. And the robots can easily weave and print things from carbon fiber which is super interesting and way more interesting than concrete, for example, and cleaner and stronger and lighter, right? Mm -hmm. So we do carbon fiber, we also weave things from a simple rope, which then you can use as a meshwork to reinforce structures. We 3D print, uh, of course, we use it as CNC, right, where you can cut things out of all kinds of materials. We use metal bending. Metal bending is very beautiful because you can make very strong 3D shapes that almost react like bricks. One of the first pressing matters had a pavilion where we used, someone donated us free flashing material. And the flashing material was one side silver, one side gold. And the students uh, folded together with a, with a robot 3D printed boulders mm -hmm. that had different shapes and that created together one huge pavilion, as big as this room, that we built outside of the school. Absolutely beautiful, free span thing. Um, so we do a lot of experiments in how, how do we make things. We also, you know, when I, when I started, I completely redid the curriculum. Mm. Because I felt the curriculum was good, but it was 19th century. It was making more architects of the past. And I felt like we had to get into the future. So the robotics lab was one of them, but also we, com we hired completely other uh, structural engineers that think about dynamic structures that work now together with our engineers that we had. Um, we think we have material um, ecologists, like people who work with Neri Oxman, for example, at MIT. Um, someone like that is working here now, so she's, she's looking at uh, mo uh, materials on nanomolecular level. Mm -hmm. So super interesting. We have people who look at environmental um, experiments and, and looking at how you can change a building to be an organism, like we discussed yesterday yeah. in the midterm. So really to see how a building itself becomes intelligent not us putting sensors everywhere, but the building itself becomes uh, smart. Um, so all these people we have over the years hired, and I was able to do that is because the school kept growing so much. So because we got so many more students, I could also hire many more um, really advanced scientists, researchers, and designers. So it's been really fun. I mean, we have a very different school now than we used to have because we have influx from the ETH in Switzerland, Bartlett and the AA in London, all kinds of people from the Netherlands, Germany, Menno Sobek comes to lecture, you know, Philip Bloch comes to lecture from, from Switzerland. So we have, and I, I, I think it's really important that the digital not just taught us how to design differently, but to also erase the boundaries between structure and design, between material ecologies and design. 
it really integrates all of it into one big project. And so that's also what I've tried to do with my curriculum. We, use, we have still structural classes, but we use the structural experts in studio. Mm -hmm. So we invite the people from these classes to come and look at the projects in studio. Like I, mas I invited Masood yesterday mm -hmm. to come and uh, evaluate the tower structures after our spring break and to give the students a session on you need to look at this, you need to look at that. Because in third year they're pretty good in structures, but you know, they could use some help, especially with the tower, the size we looked yesterday. So it's been very interesting. So that happens on theory and architecture, structures and architecture, um, sustainability in architecture, construction in architecture, professional practice. So we integrate all these things now in studio. Totally different way of teaching. Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with how we did it 10 years ago. Plus, mm -hmm. it's a very different faculty because they talk to each other. When I started, there were people over there angry and the people over there angry. And now they're working together in this book. I made them write together. Mm -hmm. So every semester has a coordinator and they work together with, um, let's see, like over here. For example, 601. Mm -hmm. Hena runs our urban housing, and she works together Hena with. Rahim. This, yeah, this is uh, Hena Jebel, and she wrote a text for her thing, together with courses that she gives, which are environmental for housing, but also mm -hmm. professional practice. So they write texts together, and also in the book we give space to uh, the students. Mm -hmm. So the students write, which are the little texts. Mm -hmm. And the big text is the professor. So even from the beginning, there's a dialogue. Very young, they come into school, they have to have a dialogue with the professor. Mm -hmm. Not like, oh, I'm the professor, you're the students, I teach you. No, it's a dialogue. So it's very interesting. So we, we, and we do a lot of material experiments. So this book is really all about dialogue between either our experts from the outside or our guests from the outside, but also internally. So that's what I've tried to do in my 10 years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, architecture field. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's, it was, it's really, you know, becoming a chair is a project. Like everything else is a project. And I realized that very early on. You have to build a foundation and then you have to branch out. No? It's like, but if you don't build the foundation, the branching makes no sense. The, uh, the second question is about you. How can we build it up, Vinka? How did this start? It? Because you, you were European, yes. Part, and then you moved and educated in the US, Colombia. I was educated both in Holland, in the Netherlands, and in Colombia and New York, yeah. Good Love. combination. Yeah, it's a great and combination. Combination. Yeah. Well, what is interesting, of course, of European education is, you know, I can, I'm here, no architect can calculate rebar in concrete. Mm -hmm. We Europeans, we can. I mean, I was from a very technical school. We got wind bracing, calculate wind bracing, calculate rebar. So, as a female architect, I'm an unusual creature because I can actually check the drawings from my engineers and say, nah, not how it goes. <laughs> I don't want that. And that they don't always like you for it, but I think it's really important. Um, but I always, I loved studying. I studied as long as I could. I even did half a PhD, mm -hmm. but I bored myself, so I stopped the PhD. Um, but yeah, I studied a long time. And then when I started working, I realized I missed academics. So. Right when I started my own office, I also was teaching, uh, actually with Ben van Berkel initially, uh, at Columbia. That was my first teaching job. And then after that semester with Ben, I started teaching one semester here and one semester Columbia. I did that for eight years. Mm -hmm. Then I taught at Harvard for a few years. Then Penn was like, where is, where is this person? 
and asked me to come back and do I start the, um, the post-professional. So that's a short version of the, my academics. Uh, my office started in 94, very small office, you know, first like one desk in a shared office. Uh, after a while we had the whole loft in Soho. I worked in the front, lived in the back on Mercer Street next to Balthazar. Balthazar, I spent a lot of money in Balthazar, my <laughs> office and I. <laughs> Coffee shop, very nice. And yeah, we were, I think we were very lucky. You know, the 90s, there was not a lot of construction going on in the US. Mm -hmm. Because I have also a sculptural background, I studied sculpture for a few years, I was always more about making and just so I did, I did exhibits where I would make really dark photo etchings while I was working for Eisenman was my therapy, I think. <laughs> did very dark photo etchings. And then I put them in big steel mats and I had an exhibit in a, in a little place in the East Village. But funny enough, Terry Riley was there, who was at MoMA. And a woman was there who was um, starting a gallery. And all these people bought these pieces. And then finally this woman from the gallery was like, That's right. she gave me the gallery, yeah. That was my first project. So, you know, by making things and always putting things out there and communicating with everyone, um, I guess I started early, like I built something right away, which was a gallery and a courtyard, so it felt more like a building because we built this huge steel wall, door. Um, we had TVs, monitors in the window that were connected to cameras in the gallery. So it was inverted surveillance. It became like a thing, it was in the New York Times, like how bad it was <laughs> for privacy. <laughs> but you know, they say any news is good Stop. news. <laughs> so that was quite funny. Um, but yeah, also the exhibits could be, uh, the exhibits inside could be projected outside. Or we had, um, People who did installations, they could uh, put their videos also in the window on the monitors. So it was quite interesting how that worked as an interface. Um, and then, you know, people who needed a house saw this on West Broadway, this gallery, and they did the house, and the house ended up in MoMA in the exhibit for the unprivate, the unprivate house show. So it, it rolled on pretty fast. I did my very first book in my second year of the office which was a baby book. I call it my baby book. It was with an exhibit I did in LA, which was a 90 foot long uh, digital strip that I was one of the really first big digital printed on, on translucent mm -hmm. film, um, where I integrated Philosophical thinking, theoretical thinking, with building, with sculpture, with objects, with whatever. And that strip we then compressed into a little strip and folded it up in a CD box. And I sent it to the publisher in Holland and they made a book out of it. So that was my first book. But then the strip traveled to the Kunsthal in Rotterdam, to Ljubljana, mm -hmm. to the Dessa Gallery, which is really funny. So that little strip of 90 foot long traveled everywhere with me. And it was just a fun period, you know, I think in a weird way, I don't know how I did it. You know, you just did it. I have no idea, but I remember sitting hours buying my little teeny weeny computers where the screen was this size, right? If I pasted something in that strip, because it became so large, I could go shopping, <laughs> come back. And hopefully it was, think, uh oh, I hope it doesn't crash. It was super dangerous. I mean, it was so hard to work in computers in that time. So it was, it was interesting, but a lot happened very early. Oh. So I think because I always did everything, I just kind of slowly moved. I'm also very slow, which is a funny contradiction, I think. You know, I, I don't really feel like I need to be over-publicized or... I like, I'm a bit of a hermit. I like to work and write and think and read. So I don't really, 
uh, focus on that side of the of the world very much. Mm -hmm. which gives me more time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, to make these babies, I do a lot of work myself on this. You know, there's a lot of talking to people, convincing them to write, telling them how to write it, like inspiring them, seeing what you can, how you can push things, where we can break boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, because every person individually breaks boundaries. But how do we break boundaries as a, as a school? How do we do it together? How do they learn from each other? It's super interesting. So we are also giving courses, images, mm -hmm. which I think is really important, right? Like mm -hmm. normally courses are things in the back of the book. We have the courses. So for example, you just saw housing. These are all the courses that they get while they study housing. Mm -hmm. So this is also a course where they study environment with some strange experimental things, X-ray-like, which is Dorita Vif. Lindsay, this is visual studies where they learn, you know, to represent things different ways. So it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's all one big thing for me. <coughs> I don't separate anything, which is probably also problematic mm -hmm. for, <laughs> I mean, what I do is who I am, more or less. And so, you know, it's a, it's a life project also, I could yeah. say. You, you, at the same time, you design, build, and teach. Yeah. It's a good combination. Yeah, and write. Aldo Rusty once uh, said that. Always, when I'm really interested in that the, uh, the, there is no boundaries in between and among them. Yeah. And then a, a lifetime education and lifetime yeah. enjoy of knowledge. I also feel that's really the amazing lucky thing we have as an architect. Our lives are fabulous, mm. I think. You know, I think Being we, an architect? Yeah. I think we are the luckiest people because we can really design. I mean, we have a, we have a profession that is as hard as being a brain surgeon, which no one realizes. Um, but we also get to work with amazing people inspire people, you know, make incredible teams, rethink how, you know, what I told you yesterday, we only won the Asian Games with my office because we mm -hmm. completely rethought how teams should work. And we realized that if you don't follow the traditional roles, but you make everyone equal, Oh my God, Gavran, the difference in how people work with you. They became authors. They, they were taking responsibility for any part of it. It wasn't like, oh, this is structures, so I only deal with structures. No, they were like, they were full on there as thinking partners. So the, the one of the heads of Thornton Domasetti, you know, one of the main engineers, the Jerry Van Eyck who runs Melk from the landscape company, we didn't get some engineer or some landscape. No, we got them personally with me and all our staffs to work on this project because we had, what is it, 47 hectares and seven buildings to design in two months, I think. Yeah. Six weeks, two months. So we all put well, everything aside. kilometers, right? The white? 1.6 kilometers long, yeah. 47 hectares. Yeah, buildings are 35,000 square meters. You know, they're really large, but they're also completely sustainable. Landscape is an ecosystem. We rebuild the natural, the natural biome because we kill our biomes. You know, like a biome means that if I don't have native plants, I don't get native insects, I don't get native birds, right? So we kill the balance. And we, by bringing back all the native plants, we kind of almost immediately restored birds and insects and waterways we cleaned with making small islands uh, with local vegetation. We used wetland plants to clean the water. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, you know, these are very beautiful and poetic things when you look at them. 
but they're actually all little organisms that work, mm -hmm. that do their job, which is very fun. And uh, in the book, right, there is a, the Asian Games yeah. field here. Yeah, right? they are, yeah, let me see, here. Ah, okay. So this is, yeah, that's but a field hockey. You'll, you'll publish in a uh, uh, separate a book, I think. This that one. is so funny that you say that because I am already working on it. Really? Yeah. Because it, the whole it, project. It's, it's worth it. Yeah. Because there are many uh, drawings, documents. Yeah. And, and funny the, enough. The, and also, the, you already designed and built time almost three three years three years is amazing yeah it so was fast. actually four years to the opening right we won in 2018 um, it opens this year in September we were done October last year with the buildings so the years the buildings were done a year ahead but it was necessary also because they still had to build out the inside and for example there's a shopping valley you see here very mm -hmm. beautifully this has only under construction photos which is an almost finished, you see, but not done yet. Which I actually love for this book because this book is what we call the anti-monograph. Mm -hmm. This is all about how do we rethink working in teams, how do we rethink the role of an architect, how do we become more also the designers of how components are made, how facades, um, structures are made, what are new materials, can we develop new materials. But I love this photo, for example, when I got this photo, we had, uh, because of the pandemic, we did site visits with the drone. Mm. So my local architect would have a drone and I could go, you know, it was actually amazing because imagine a building like the stadium, I don't even forget how high it is, it's like a 10 story building, I think. Mm. So you're tiny, right? How do you inspect the facade mm. of a 10-story building, which is this complex, you know, with this diagram, like this guy, right? Mm -hmm. You can see a person here is like down here. <laughs> so to do inspection for this would be impossible. But with a drone, no problem. He would just scan the facade for me going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I would find a detail here I didn't like. So I would say, can you take a photo of that detail? And then I could send it back to the contractor and say, you know, that rubber there needs like a little adjustment. And, and could you do that for all of them? Like, just push it in a bit more. And they'll go, yeah, sure. So, you know, and then this, this is amazing. The client loved the brass shingles. Hmm. And we wanted the brass shingles to be 3D, but also the glass to be 3D. And they're both double curves. So the glass we solved by making little eyelids mm -hmm. from the diagrid to the glass, which means that it's like fish scales. Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, it's not smooth. We, we wanted it to be looking like a texture. Mm -hmm. And the same with the brass shingles. They have a real texture. So these brass shingles are custom designed. There is 8,000 shingles in 85 different shapes because of BIM, we were able to optimize um, how to build things. We, we saved 1130 tons of steel because of the suspend dome roof and no columns. No columns, yes. No columns. Yeah, the roof you see here, actually. This is the whole park, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was me on site. <laughs> what was funny is that they gave us our orange helmets and I had my rock t-shirt, <laughs> my orange rock t-shirt on. But um, field hockey, I think this the TT is before here, yeah. So this is the bulging of, inter it's an intersecting set of discs, the building. And I did that, this is the roof. I did that because it's a hybrid building. So it's both, we didn't want to make a white elephant that is after the Asian Games dead. So we designed it from the beginning to be a hybrid seating system um, and a concert hall after the mm. Asian Games, an event space. So there has a beautiful set of ramps that fly around the inner bowl. 
and here you see the eyelids. Mm -hmm. So my local guy here designed it. The span of this diagram, if you look at this guy, it's, the glass is seven meters by five meters, one sheet. Mm -hmm. And that's only possible because it's straight and it sits on these little eyelids. See the, see the little jumps? But the eyelids is only a negotiation of this span, so they're like this high every time. They go from zero to the point and then zero. So I see them as like eyelids, like your eye. And this is the roof. You see the suspendo? Mm -hmm. So the roof is beautiful. It's really deep in the middle. And then it sits on the inner bowl and cantilevers and carries this facade. So no columns at all. Great. It's amazing, huh? Great job. But this is only possible. This is not us. This is, this is because Thornton Tomasetti from the beginning was there. And when I say no columns, how can we do this? They go suspend them. Hmm. And came up. I mean, it went so fast, these, these design decisions. It's amazing. This is the use of the park after the Asian Games, all the users. This was done by Melk, mm -hmm. you know, a landscape architect. So we had like a diagram of every possible user after the Games. Look at this. Mm -hmm. This was already last spring. So this was May 2021. Suddenly, the park had <laughs> grass. It went from mud and construction site in one month to grass and cherry blossom and gravel paths because we have a sponge city, we need to absorb the water, and little islands. And the park was done. And we were like, how on earth did they do that? Because it is 47 hectares of this stuff. And look how beautiful. It's just ridiculous. And they built everything like we drew it. So, but the funny thing is, this is where the inspiration is. Yeah, it comes from the... Right? A tiny meditation pod. Well, for 35 people, but like, you know. This is where we started thinking about free structures. And it's just a meditation pod. So in the office, we never work only on big projects. We work on tiny projects with startup companies and help them build their identity through space. And then we use that information for big projects. And that's, been re that's why we feel we're a laboratory. You know, we're not an architecture office. We're an architecture office, but we're also a laboratory. Because we get, thank God, clients who let us do this. And you say the small projects uh, inspire, bring in a new idea, and then the big idea yeah. for, for the for yeah. the large project. So this is this bulging thing mm -hmm. that sits in the middle of the space, which is way too large for the space. And we did that on purpose. We wanted it to be bouncing to the edges. And this is bamboo, and inside it's a seat. And that seat holds distributed air that is filtered with aromatherapy. Mm -hmm. It holds micro speakers behind this fabric mm -hmm. to create perfect sound. I always say this is the smallest space with the most engineering. We had to use Ova Arab to get acoustics right because it was so difficult. <laughs> we had to use MEP engineers to get the air distributed so you would never feel the air rushing because you're sitting in a little mm -hmm. t-shirt, no? It was very funny. And then we spanned. This thing is still really large for a span, a free span. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a spiraling dome, a grid shell. So that, you know, it's really fun to combine. You see it being instructed. Here you see the distributed air, you see, mm -hmm. coming through. This is the section. So we made the dome and then I pulled the skin up to the ceiling. So I created this space in between where I could do all the technology. Because, you know, I had to have so much stuff. And we prefabricated. This is also funny because it doesn't have a construction set. It has, um, you know, when you buy a vacuum cleaner, you get a, mm -hmm. a manual. This has a manual. Mm. Because we can send these drawings around to any local prefabricator and make it locally. Mm to like make sure we don't waste money and gas and pollution, whatever. 
So anyone can make this locally from these little guys. Make a ring, clad it with bamboo, like you see that here, mm -hmm. and then make it locally. And so that was also asked by the client. They wanted to roll this out internationally. So this is, this was funny. We did a one-to-one -one mock up. Mm. A friend of mine has the biggest independent car design company in the US. And he has a factory where he tries things. So he gave me a whole hall and he built the thing one-to-one -one for the client. Because the and client couldn't imagine how it would look. One-to-one -one mock up. Yes. See, this right. is my, one of my guys sitting there where this whole thing is made, one-to-one. -one. And then my client wanted to meditate in the space to feel, you see how big it is, by the way. Mm. It's a really large thing. He wanted to meditate in the factory with the whole team. He brought us, he brought the meditator, he brought everyone to try this out in LA. And then we meditated. And then he asked my friend, who is the head of this car design company and a big guy from England, you know, does this mm -hmm. stuff not usually? He said, you have to meditate too, because if you want to work on this project, you have to understand the state of mind we're in. So it was quite funny. Yeah, and and also the, you designed some uh, fashion yeah. showroom. I did all the stores for Ports uh, 9061, yeah. Hair dressing. Yeah. And then you tried something there and, uh, as a volume or yeah. some objects. It always ends up in the buildings, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a store in Shanghai. For ports, we did the stores in London, Paris, and Shanghai. I only put Shanghai because that was the first one where we set the tone for all the others. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot about recycled materials. We recycled the wood of an old Chinese house to make this liner for the space, mm -hmm. uh, which is this rough wood. We, again, prototype, do mock-ups. This was really fun. So this. This rough liner was recycled wood, but then we robotically CNC'd it. Mm -hmm. And also these slots are essentially either sound systems or uh, air conditioning. So this, mm. this very rustic, old-looking thing actually contains all the technology. So there's no technology in this space. Also niches. These really amazing curves. You can only do this when you robotically CNC it. And then the columns in the space, we clad with um, a 60s material, which is prefabricated. It's like uh, fiber. fiber reinforced cement, yeah. And so they made these fiber like reinforced gigantic reinforced cement. Yeah. They made these gigantic things, and then they look at these guys sitting mm. on it. And that's these columns. We had two of those. They were actually hiding some really ugly columns. So we made like these exhibition elements around them. And then the space, look how fluid the space became. But all prefabricated elements first and then filling it in. We would like to show the, all your projects on, uh, on the screen later on, if we get. I have one really fun uh, animation of the book I can give you. Really? Yeah, where you just leaf through it a little bit. Wow. And I can give you some images, yeah. Okay, it would be, would be fantastic, right? Because we talk about some, some your projects, but nobody uh, sees that. Now. Sees this, yeah. No, of course. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It was very uh, informative and uh, fun. Thank you. Because really fun to talk you, to you. you always, yes. You're always uh, the, the good person and uh, give, give us the energy. Thank you, thank you. What is your sign? Cancer. With a Leo rising. <laughs> <laughs> Leo. I realize that. <laughs> yeah. Good combo. Good combo. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is funny. Have you seen this one? Mm. I love this project. This is um, fabric cloth. This is a. I did this for a. This guy was an intern in my office and then became one of the best fashion designers. Mm -hmm. um, 
And when he had a, he was part of the Fashion Biennale in Holland. Mm. And he called me and he said, well, it's Holland. I work for you. You need to do this with me. Mm. And I asked him, I'll do it with you if you gave me your favorite pattern mm. of any clothing piece. So he did, which sadly, he makes very experimental clothing, but he actually gave me just a normal jacket. <laughs> I'm like, really? That's your favorite? So then we took it apart as a pattern. We asked him to give us just the pattern. These are the pattern pieces. Mm. Then we made it three-dimensional in the computer. And then it became this kind of thing. Suddenly it had three sleeves, which is interesting, but we basically blew up the patterns into 3D. And then it became this really weird machine that we built from concrete cloth, mm. which is usually used in England for little bomb shelters in your garden. Mm -hmm. The fun is with this is a cloth, if you spray it with water, it um, becomes completely structural concrete, but only half yeah. an inch. So I gave the installers. Yeah, it also looks like uh, the cotton. I know, it's beautiful. Fish, cotton. So I gave the, the installers, I gave them a frame of rebar, this frame, mm -hmm. that they could weave from rebar. Then I told them, you can use five different ways of connecting it, but choose whatever you want, because, you know, I wasn't there. They, they chose rivets, folds, seams, whatever. And then the thing is, looks like this. I called it a war machine because <laughs> it, it had this really incredible ancient looking feeling. Look, these are the guys installing with hazmat suits because it's very dusty. And then on the, on the exhibit, everyone was sniffing it, knocking on it, stroking it. <laughs> and the people from the exhibit actually said that it was their favorite thing. Look at people staring at it. They have no clue what the freaking hell they're looking at, no? So the, the, so I thought it was a war machine, but the organization from the Fashion Minala called it the cuddly elephant. <laughs> <laughs> so it was yeah, a very it looks funny. Like elephant also. They are right. It's funny, right? It's such a weird thing. And there's a great it's photo. A creature, man. Yeah, Not here's the... this is Ziki. He's looking with with a guest at the fashion show, which we also made look like a really old um, kind of screen inside of there. Fun, right? Fantastic. It's an ancient machine. Fantastic. And we had in the end one sleeve, and Ziki was like, "No, I don't want to show um, the fashion. This is the statement." I'm like you have to show your fashion. I don't let you <laughs> not show your fashion. So he put, I made one sleeve and he put three people on it. And that's all he wanted to show. So it's quite amazing. And the movie. There are many projects here. How many projects did you publish? I only actually have a selection of projects where I felt we were really Select. in. Selected. Yeah, these are a selection of projects where I felt we really shifted something in architecture, where we, we kind of either worked with a manufacturer to make a different system or we reused materials in, in completely other ways. Like, this was funny because the company that makes the bomb shelter material realized bomb shelters weren't a hot thing anymore. So when an architect called them and said, can we use that material, they gave it to us for free. Ah. Which is amazing. Because yeah. it's a big thing. Absolutely. Yeah. But beautiful, no? Yeah. These guys made this. I was, I came and I could cry. Because they did such a great job. We couldn't get a contractor to build this. Mm. We found a sculptor, an artist, who had a team that built it for us. Because can you imagine this fabric is super heavy. To make these seams. Mm. Mm -hmm. These guys were crazy. I mean, sometimes I think we ask difficult things. But like, I love the photos with the hazmat suits. Like, look at them. So here they're stitching, you really, riveting. You really like the, the construction process, the photos, right? 
Well, because we because you dream, and then uh, you design, and then uh, people work on it. Yeah. And, uh, without for, these guys, design, hmm? yeah, without these guys, we wouldn't have our dream, right? I mean, to me, this part is almost more interesting than the end result. Hmm. To get it done, at some point, it was like so difficult to build this that the organization called me and said, "We're going to build it half scale." Hmm. I was like, "Half scale," because they couldn't afford it. So I called the concrete cloth company and said, "Can you do it for free, the material?" And they're like, "Yeah." So like, "Okay, we can do it full scale." <laughs> So you become, it's, yeah, you have to, you realize how much energy you put in everything, no? How much convincing, 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 convincing especially. talking. Maybe half of uh, the uh, design is a half, maybe half the uh, uh, managing the people, convincing the people. Oh, no, I think it's 10% 50, 50. design. 90%. Do you say 10%? 10 design. <laughs> and For me, design... The design is like uh, strategy oh, working on getting it done if you want to do anything that is not normal mm -hmm. is there any course about that you can <laughs> the uh, whole education is like that have you noticed <laughs> <laughs> is that is what I teach them <laughs> yeah but this is the, uh, the architect to architect it look like you know uh, is it easy you know the first thing I do in my studio First class, introduction. Second class, they've done research. Research, only one class. Hmm. No long research. Long research, bad. Short research, in-depth. Whole team does it. They learn from each other, done. The next class, however, is they have to come up with a concept and sell it to us. Hmm. And that's three classes. They have to give us arguments, why the argument is good, how do arguments become architecture, and what is it? That is the, the biggest part of the concept. How to translate research into an argument, into a form, into a, something you believe in and you can sell. If they cannot sell it, I send them back. Go try again. That was useless. That's when yesterday I said to some of the students, maybe before you came, I was like, you just sold it to me. Because mm. <laughs> if I know if you cannot convince someone, you are not going to make it. Exactly. It doesn't work. You have to learn how to. So I teach Encourage them. Encourage them and then. Uh, no, I, I, it's military tactics. The military tactics. This is like hard. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm very nice. But yeah, like, at that moment, I'm not, because I'm the like, construct, especially the construction side, like the battlefield. It's a battlefield. It's a guerrilla strategy. Yeah. Military works. Yeah. I, w I walked when I walked in that orange T-shirt on the side. It was like so large. We had to take a car from building to building. <laughs> <laughs> and I arrived at the field hockey stadium, and I took one look. The field hockey stadium is really beautiful in the sense it's a huge wing and the field is recessed in the park. So the field is flat, but the area around it goes up five meters. Mm. So the seats are recessed five meters, it's very beautiful. So the, 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 the building is very low and very in the landscape and the field is very protected and it's a... Um, it's like the seed of life. It's two ellipses intersecting the roof and the field. And the field, of course, is square, but the area is an ellipse and deeply recessed, five meters on one side and perfectly level on the other side. Mm. So from the end, you can walk in. But then, although you keep walking straight, the side goes up five meters around you. So, you know, so the building becomes an earthwork or a sculpture. Exactly. Earthwork. Yeah. Anyway. I have to go. Thank you very much. Thank you.